Hi folks, it's Steve. I am I'm here once again with Frank Du, a business coach, a business consultant, an expert in the focal point perspective on personal growth and managing your business. And once again, my companion in discussing emotional intelligence, especially as it applies to business owners. Hello, Frank. Hello, Steve. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you. Good, that was a you. long introduction, but you, you deserved it. <laughs> it was eloquent. Thank you. So we're going to talk today about communication styles and expressing emotions. So why are we talking about that when it comes to emotional intelligence? What's the link between communication styles and expressing emotions and emotional intelligence? Well, it's a great question because, you know, just to kind of revisit, uh, Emotional intelligence doesn't, you know, uh, as as it applies to EQ, doesn't relate to having emotions or not having emotions. We all have emotions. Uh, but then it really applies to how aware you are of your emotions and how aware you are of the emotions of the people around you that you interact with. And so just as a revisiting, uh, the more aware we are of that, then the the better our communication will be through uh the recognition of others emotions and our own so you're saying that you you first have to be aware of your own emotions before you can under, you can detect the emotions of somebody else it helps definitely uh you know <clears throat> we all kind of operate on on some level of unawareness with our emotions but generally speaking as we spoke the last time the more aware we are of the emotions that we have ourselves, the more uh, focused and centered we can be in our communication to ourselves as well as to others. And so that piece is a big part of uh, the communications to others. But as we move into uh, the communication styles and talk about uh, the different styles that people have, one of the things to keep in mind is how versatile you are. And your versatility with recognizing different styles of communication people have is largely tied to your emotional intelligence. And well, elaborate so, on that. What do you mean versatility? So versatility is, let's just say that you're, you yourself are a very analytical person. And, and so as such, uh, you ask a lot of questions. You don't tell a lot of things. You don't show a lot of emotion doesn't mean you don't have it. You just don't show it in a social situation. And so perhaps you get along really well with other analytical people because you understand how they want to be communicated to as well. And so when you have uh, communication styles aligned, regardless of emotional intelligence, you have a greater ability to have that communication. However, the versatility comes in perhaps that you're an analytical style communicator and you want to be communicated to from an analytical style, but you run into somebody that's extremely expressive. How do you, uh, how versatile are you to communicate to that expressive person and actually be heard and also understand what they're saying or doing? Well, what does that require? Becoming less analytical? I mean, how does one do that? What is that, what, what is it? How do you learn how to do that? Well, it's uh, uh, really practice and awareness. So first off, if, you, if you're not aware, it won't matter because you're not going to be able to do it. And secondly, a lot of people are, because they have a high level of emotional intelligence, they're almost uh, unconsciously capable of, of having greater versatility anyway, because the emotional intelligence is a, a factor where you're actually paying attention to and aware of other people's states of emotion. And so as a result of that, their communication to that person tends to be a little bit higher. Now, for an example, though, uh, just to kind of break it down into a, a, a four quadrant scenario, if you think of people that ask more than they tell and people that emote more than they don't emote, and so those are the two different axes you'd look at. And so uh, generally speaking, an analytical style communicator, somebody that socially behaves and communicates uh, as an analytical would be somebody that 
would not, as I mentioned, uh, tell. They'd ask a lot of questions and they don't show a lot of emotion. On on the same side of things, uh, perhaps, and, and you know, I'm not sure if you're aware of the the uh, the 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 system and company called DISC, but DISC goes through that scenario too. And that particular type of person would be called a steady person, and and or a compliant person. My 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 apologies. And so then below that would be let's say an amiable or a steady person. And again, they don't tell as much as they ask. They ask more. And they show more emotion than an analytical person. And then to the right of that would also be somebody that shows more emotion. And they like to tell rather than ask. And in their form of communication, they're telling you things rather than asking you things. That person is uh, basically an expressive, influential type person. And, and they tend to uh, you know, talk with their hands more. They show more emotion as they're as they're communicating and and they might be uh more easily you can sort of they, they wear their emotions on their face so that you can really kind of tell where they're at and then uh beside the analytical and above the expressive is the driver type person the dominant person the person that tells more than they ask and they don't show a lot of emotion and so that person seems to be really driven uh but doesn't mean they don't have emotion. And so back to the versatility, as you increase your emotional intelligence, you can move regardless of what your nature is. You can move between quadrant and quadrant and deal with amiables, expressives, analyticals, and drivers all uh, in the same way because you have you understand how they like to be communicated to. And so your emotional intelligence helps drive that. So you're saying I'm a, I'm more emotionally intelligent if I can be more expressive with an expressive person, be more analytical with an analytical person, be more driven with a driven person. It's I I show a different part of myself. Yeah, you're you're a bit of a chameleon because uh, you're able to adapt to how somebody else's communication skills are. Do people actually pull this off? All the time. You have to, you have to practice it though. And so I'll tell you, I'll give another layer, which is kind of really interesting from an entrepreneurial standpoint and definitely a sales standpoint. So, uh, you know, you sell life insurance, you walk into somebody's house and you sit down and let's say you're talking to a husband and the husband is analytical. And so you recognize that based on the fact that he's not showing a lot of emotion. And uh, he asks lots of questions because he wants all the information. And, and so you go through that and you adapt because you're just, you know, you're so used to it. You're good at what you do. And so you're, you're, you're working towards the way he wants to be communicated to. And so that shows a bit of versatility because potentially you're not uh, analytical yourself. And so then the wife comes in and his spouse sits down at the table. And let's say she's expressive. So how do you actually sell life insurance to a couple when the uh, husband, let's say, is very analytical and the wife, the spouse, is very expressive, which they're kind of on opposite tracks. And so you as a salesperson in the middle, how do you understand that? How do you become aware of it? It's part of your emotional intelligence. And then how do you then communicate to both of them at the same time while giving them the way they want it to be communicated and furthering the whole process of actually selling life insurance. Well, that's actually a, a pretty good description of the dynamics involved in a, in a sale. Um, the fact is that a married couple or, or two business partners are very often different personalities, especially in business. You might have somebody who's a number cruncher partnered with a salesperson and those guys definitely have different styles um is what i've done is i've often brought out a number cruncher factual person to do joint work with me and let that person talk the techno language 
um, rather than me doing it my myself. I you know it's to a certain point you have to, but if you I've I've used a technique of partnering with people whose styles complement my own. You know, you talk to her, you talk to him, and um, <laughs> and what do you think about that? Is that is that is that counter the strategy of becoming more emotionally intelligent or is that applying it well it's a bit of both truthfully so uh it's smart because you know if your versatility is not high enough to be able to deal with both types of styles uh then you might not get that sale and so if you bring in somebody that has a stronger uh tie to somebody else's style that you don't have there is a greater chance that that person is going to be able to communicate in the way that the you know prospect really wants to be communicated to. So that's just smart. Now, ultimately though, over time with the intentionality and practice, that could just be you. Wait, so are you still maintaining that the goal is for each individual to become well-rounded in all four categories? Exactly. And it's a challenge. And, and also if, when you think of how this applies to emotional intelligence, if you yourself aren't aware of your own emotions and how you communicate, how you like to be communicated to, it's going to be really, really hard for you to understand how others might feel about things and how they want to be communicated to. Well, how does somebody do that? Do they have to go to therapy or what's the technique for, for discovering your own style or where you are predominantly in that well, matrix? There, there's a few techniques. One, I mean, we've talked about it in the last couple of sessions where uh, we spoke about just, you know, when you, when you feel anxious, then there's actually a thought before that feeling. And then when you recognize that you feel anxious, then you can take it back a little bit and understand what that thought was and then recognize that that thought created a feeling. And that whole process in itself allows you to be more emotionally intelligent because you're aware that you have a thought that generated the feeling in the first place, even if it's an automatic thought. And so that part is one piece of it, a shortcut to the process of finding out where you stand in the, in, in the, in the situation though, is also, uh, you know, take a disc assessment, take a, there's a whole like current Briggs or, uh, what's the Briggs company, uh, you know, there's a bunch of all these assessments that are uh, personal profile type assessments. And so they'll generally tell you with a fair amount of accuracy, what style you tend to be in. And so that will heighten your awareness at, of seeing yourself and you read the report, and you realize that, you know, that's me, that sounds like me, that sounds like me. And so then you start to understand how you like to be communicated to and how you communicate. And so that's step one. Step two is to recognize the other ways of communication, generally speaking, and then how to identify them. And then through practice, you, you understand how to navigate through that and increase your versatility. And it's directly related to the emotional intelligence that you bring to the table. Are you saying that we each have a little bit of the of the DISC in each of us? We have to bring it out, or with some people, is it you have to start from scratch? No, we all have. We all we all communicate in one way or the other uh, through through DISC, for an example, DISC. And and uh, uh, that said, though, uh, there's likely one area of that that you're stronger in than the others. And so being more aware of what where where you like to communicate, how in touch with your own emotions you are, and how you communicate that and what you ask for or tell somebody to do will be a good indicator of how you get things that you want. And so then to relate that into how others want to be communicated to, and to be aware uh, from an emotional intelligence standpoint of reading the signs of how somebody is showing emotion or they're not showing emotion. They're asking a lot of questions or they're telling you a lot of things.
do we have like a predominant is it like we have one dominant style and the rest is equally subordinate or do we have like a major a minor and the rest do we have like a next to dominant style it, it's uh it, you know you could break it down the fact that everybody almost every i would say everybody has a piece of each one style in them uh, uh one dominant style will 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 drive how they like to generally be uh communicated to and and uh their level of emotional intelligence is attached to that however uh no one style is better than another because we all have emotions if we're aware of them or not and so uh the the more we're in touch with what our emotions are and what triggers our emotions and how we feel about different things the more we're able to communicate with others and understand how they want to be communicated too. So there's a couple of different ways to get better at it. Uh, and, and the, it really all, you know, I saw, I, I spoke to a, a, a psychotherapist uh, quite a few number of years ago, and he told me one thing that really, really stands out when it comes to, uh, you know, figuring things out. And, and really at the end of the day, it all starts with you. So when you can start to figure out what makes you tick, then you have a better awareness of what makes others tick. And so as you do that, you increase your emotional intelligence. It increases your ability to have communication. You mentioned earlier, earlier the importance of being centered within your emotions. That's often cited as part of personal growth. What does it actually mean to you to be centered? <clears throat> highly aware. And so the, the, the more aware you are of the emotions that you have, then the more at peace you can be because you're aware that they're separate from you. And so uh, you can have, you can, you know, feel an emotion and it will pass. And so when you're aware of what that emotion, how it was kicked off in the first place, and then you understand that it will pass, then you can have that emotion and be at peace at the same time. And so that's centering. So centered equals highly aware equals mindfulness. Would yes. you say that's a sentiment? Would you say that's the same thing? Yeah, well, big overlap for sure. A big overlap. Okay, and um, besides the, the little workshop type activity that you talked about where you could find out what your style is what other methods are there to be to develop this self-awareness the <clears throat> self-awareness well as it as it applies to others is to ask yourself at first uh when you're speaking about communication uh are you listening to understand or you're listening to respond? And so if you're listening to understand, then you'll be more aware of what that person's trying to communicate to you. And so even if you have different styles, then you'll say a statement, it doesn't compute for me and I'm listening to understand, so I'll ask you in a different way. And so at some point, you'll you'll be able to communicate what you're really thinking and feeling, and I'll understand that. Whereas if I'm listening to respond, you're going to say a bunch of stuff, and I'm just going to say whatever I had on cue anyway. And it's nothing to do with what you just said, because I have my own agenda. And so when it comes to an entrepreneur, uh, that has employees, for an example, and an employee has a, a, a challenge or a grievance, and they have a particular standpoint on, on where they're coming from with that. And a lot of times an employer will just listen to them talk until they stop talking and then tell them what they want to tell them, which is completely different from, let me actually understand where you're coming from and see how we can work together to come up with a solution well that brings up a an interesting dimension to this because 
not everybody are is equal in in a business relationship. There's a hierarchy of authority. So that to me has always meant that not every conversation with somebody that's a subordinate is has the goal of mutual understanding. I mean, I think that helps, but at some point you've got to just give a directive. Um, correct. I yes, mean, definitely. I mean, uh, if if you run the business and you hold the risk of that business, then you have to direct what happens because it's your risk, not theirs. And so, totally agree. Uh, and we get more done through others. So as we get more done through others, if we understand what where others stand, then uh, we can work through a solution that does create that directive. Sometimes there's just things that you have to do that you don't want, want to do. That's life. But also when you understand where somebody's coming from, then you have a better opportunity to communicate back to them why it's important they have to do what they don't want to do. That can take place at a, yeah, right after the the encounter that requires getting something done. So that's almost talking about um, managers and owners, people that have to supervise others, having a dedicated time for relationship building, uh, as opposed to online, you know, daily supervision. Um, which is, and it, 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 when you got to get things done and that's not the time to become emotionally sensitive unless somebody has a really big problem. Exactly. If there's right. a task at hand, you have to do the task. I mean, that's what you get hired to do in the first place. Right. I mean, I'm sure you do things you don't want to do every day, but nobody else is going to do them for you. So you do them. Right. Right. And, you know, I've been in plenty of subordinate roles and prior jobs and all this, so I just got to do what I'm told. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. Um, to wrap up, um, what are any last comments or thoughts you have about expressing emotions and communication styles? Well, I mean, we covered a lot of things and we, we went in a, a couple of different directions, but I would say that one of the, the key aspects is a, understand yourself, understand uh, what your emotions are, what triggers your emotions, and uh, to be used to use that awareness uh, to be able to direct yourself before you communicate to others. And so also uh, to increase your awareness of how others are reacting. And so just a basic scenario, are they, do you, do you hear them telling you a lot of things versus asking you a lot of things? Do they, do you notice that they're showing a lot of emotion or not showing a lot of emotion? And that shows you a good way to how they want to be communicated to. And the, the better we communicate to the people that we're trying to communicate with, the more results we get. Golly gee, <laughs> that certainly makes some sense. Um, both in a business work in a workplace, but plus also in home life. I get that. Okay. All right, Frank, you have enlightened us once again with your wisdom. I appreciate that. And um, thank you. And everybody stay tuned because we still have a, the last segment in this series on emotional intelligence. So stay tuned and we'll see you then. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.